Well, good morning. So glad to see you this morning. Um, just want to share something real quick from Terry and Martha. They asked if I could share this. Uh, they would like to uh, express their thanks to all the loving church family for all that you guys, all the good wishes that you gave, the lovely cards that you shared uh, with them uh, to help celebrate their 40th uh, wedding anniversary. It was a special uh, um, time yesterday. And so, uh, not yesterday, but last week. Um, and so they wanted to thank uh, Alan Allen for the beautiful music and uh, just thank you for you guys showing up uh, last Sunday after second service for those who were able to stay and just celebrate their 40th anniversary. And so they just would like to say thank you. A couple of things coming up this week. Um, we have uh, this, uh, let's try that again. Not this week. But coming up in the next few weeks, uh, in two weeks we have Vacation Bible School coming up uh, on Tuesday and Thursday, not this week, but um, next week. Um, we are still looking for people who you want to volunteer. We would love to have you be a part of Vacation Bible School. Um, the sign-up sheets are still there um, on the Welcome Center. We also have leader guides. If you've already signed up and you have, you're a leader or you're doing something in there, make sure to look at the Welcome Center. There are some uh, different uh, guides, uh, a couple different pa uh, pamphlets, booklets for you to pick up. And so just check and make sure. We also have a couple more things that we need for VBS that are hanging on the little post out there. Um, so be looking for that. Um, we have some prayer cards that are out there. Pick up a prayer card, be praying for the kids, be praying for the leaders, be praying for the event that everything would go well and that we'd be able to share uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ to the kids that come, uh, the VBS. And then we have an important meeting um, after second service next week for all leaders, anybody who's going to be involved in volunteering for Vacation Bible so, School. So we hope you can stay and uh, be a part of that meeting Next week, 
um, after second service. August, uh, the I'm sorry, July 24th, we're going to be having crew ministries come in. That's in two Sundays from now. Crew is a ministry that we um, support through our missionaries. Uh, we support the Andres. The Andres are uh, on the campus of Uni- uh, campus of University of Maryland. And so, if uh, you would. Be willing to come a little bit late for service. We're going to have a 930 service. It's going to be a one service uh, Sunday, and that's in two weeks. Two weeks, 930, one service. And uh, then we'll be having um, refreshments and a meet and greet afterwards. So um, please come out for that on July 24th, one service at 930. Um, I'll be putting that out on Facebook and other places. So hopefully everybody realizes that we have one special service July 24th, Royal Rangers are going to be beginning, uh, are going to be, uh, beginning August 25th here. Uh, Royal Rangers are for right now boys in second grade to seventh grade. We want to expand that, but we need to have more leaders to be able to expand that to other grades. So right now we're going to be concentrating from second grade to seventh grade. Um, it's going to be from 6.30 to 7.30 weekly. It's going to be on Thursday nights. But it's going to begin August 25th. And so um, if you want more information about Royal Rangers, we have uh, material back on the Welcome Center right now. You can see Mike Smith, who's back there in the pink shirt there. He's uh, got his hand up if you want uh, more information or you want to talk about signing your kids up for that. Um, But we will be starting August 25th, 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. for boys in the second grade to the seventh grade. Whew. Please stand. In Hebrews, it says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. That's what we're here for this morning. To give a sacrifice of praise to our Lord, who sacrificed his life for us. Who died on the cross that we might find freedom from sin. And so this morning, let us praise our Lord with a sacrifice of praise. Put your hands together. Let's worship the Lord today. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds a victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Surely in this place We won't be quiet We shout out your praise We shout out your praise We sing to the God who heals We sing to the God who saves We sing to the God who always makes a way As he hung up on that cross he rose up from that grave. My God, still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, we were the beggars. 
were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. 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 Thank you, Lord. are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song.
You may be seated. If you'll please stand. Thomas Aquinas from the 13th century, figure in church history and important in the development of a lot of our church today, said this about prayer. Grant me, O Lord my God, a mind to know you, a heart to seek you, wisdom to find you, conduct pleasing to you, faithful perseverance uh, in waiting for you and a hope of finally embracing you. I have that prayer in my office and a lot of times I take that prayer and I'll read that prayer and meditate on that prayer. What a beautiful uh, prayer it is. 
to have, want to have that mind like God, to know his mind, a heart to seek him, a wisdom to find him, and conduct pleasing to him, and faithful perseverance in waiting for him. I know there's a lot of things that we struggle with and a lot of things that we deal with in life. And there's a lot of things going on. Every one of us lives a busy life. I know that. But I think there's times where we just need to stop and say, what is really important? And that's knowing and seeking and finding God in each of these situations that we're dealing with. To understand, to be faithful in perseverance, even when things aren't going right. To seek the Lord always. So this morning, whatever you're dealing with, whatever struggle you're going through, whatever it is, won't you seek the Lord and seek his counsel today? Won't you seek the Lord and seek his grace today? Won't you seek the Lord this morning and seek what he has for you, even in the midst of whatever it is you're dealing with? If you feel led by the Lord this morning and you want to just spend some time seeking the Lord, won't you do it as we sing? Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, most gracious God, you are truly holy. You are truly a loving and gracious God. You are truly an all-powerful God, an all-knowing God, an all-present God. Creator of this world, creator of us, the source of our salvation, we give you praise today. We thank you, Jesus, for loving us so much that you were willing to give your life on the cross for us. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for being here with us always in our hearts, always there for us in our time of need. We thank you, Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you for the church today. I thank you for those who've come out, those who are watching on Facebook. Lord, I thank you so much for each and every one of them and for their part that they have here in the Cross Church. Lord, today I pray for those who have knelt before you, those who stand before you, and those who are watching on Facebook. Lord, I pray today, whatever it is that they are dealing with, whatever they are struggling with, Lord, I pray today that you would be with them. Lord, you would work through each and every one of their situations. Lord, I pray that you would be with them whatever they're dealing with. They might find your grace. They might find your power at work in their lives. They might find the knowledge that they need in the situations that they are dealing with. Lord, we pray this week for Kathy, who's going in for surgery, that you would just be with her. We pray for healing and fast recovery already for her. Lord, I pray for Adam and Ruthie who are dealing with a funeral this week, that you would just be with them and give them strength after dealing with COVID and now going through um, a funeral this week. You would just be with them, strengthen their family, give them guidance this week, I pray. And Lord, I just pray for each and every one who might have a need. Once again, Lord, just be with each and every one of us as we're dealing with all kinds of things I know through this week. Lord, I pray right now as we turn our attention to the word, Lord, you would move me out of the way. Lord, I might proclaim your word today for your people and not mine. Lord, it is about you and it should only be about you. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn along, 1 Samuel chapter 8 today. 1 Samuel chapter 8. Now we've all wanted something at some point in our lives that we thought would be very great 
or would be a great experience or a great thing to see. We've all had great expectations with different things. And we've really wanted something before in our lives, right? There's, we've had those moments where we thought we wanted something really bad in our lives, or we really wanted to see something in our lives, or go somewhere in our lives. We had it all in our minds, and it's going to be this great thing. It's going to be a great trip. It's going to be a great experience. It's going to be a great thing that's going to do wonderful things in our lives. We've all had those moments, right? Those things that we thought. And then when we've gotten what we've wanted, or we've gone where we wanted, or we've seen what we've wanted, or whatever it is, we realize it wasn't as great as we thought it was going to be, right? Nobody's ever had that experience. (laughs) I remember when I was in the uh, military, and is there anybody from Texas here or claims Texas as their home state? You would raise your hand if you do. Okay. I want to say I, I love Texas. I love Texans. And I know everything is bigger and greater in Texas, as they say. But I was quite disappointed when I was in Texas, when I was in basic training. I got a day pass at the end when I got ready to graduate from basic training. And I got to go into the town of San Antonio. And while I was in San Antonio, there was this place called the Alamo. Yes, Remember the Alamo. And I thought, wow, I want to go see the Alamo. I, I was kind of a history buff. That's the, about the one subject in high school I was really good at, and I really loved and enjoyed high, uh, history. So I was like, I want to go see the Alamo. And I had this big expectation of seeing this great, big, huge fort and get this great uh, um, you know, tour of it and everything. I thought it was going to be great. I walk in there. There's no tour guides. I go through the gate, I'm looking at the structure, I'm like, is this really this fort, the Alamo that everybody talks about? I go in and I literally walk the place in maybe 15 minutes. I had to actually stop and read signs to make it a little bit longer of a tour than what it was. I was unimpressed. I'm sorry. I know the Alamo was an important part of Texas history and American history, but I was unimpressed with the Alamo. I thought something would be greater from that. It wasn't the only disappointment I had that day. I got to eat out. You know, it was the first time I got to eat out, and uh, I was with some other guys. And it was the first time I ever went to Olive Garden. Are you any Olive Garden fans in here? Raise your hand. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Now I'm going to offend Olive Garden people. I was not impressed with Olive Garden either. (laughs) It was an unimpressive day for me on my graduation from basic training. But we have those things where we think in our minds we're going to make it great. We we really need this or we really want this or we got to have this. And when we get it, we realize it isn't what we all thought it was going to be. Israel is at a turning point here in 1 Samuel. Before this, they had leaders that came up and kind of led them out of different situations, different things, led them into the promised land. They had these different leaders that was raised up as judges. But now Israel wants something more. They want a king. And they go to Samuel to ask for a king. And we realize, really, what Israel is doing is not just wanting a king, but they're rejecting God because God ultimately wanted to be their king. So let's take a read of this this morning. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of the of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijan, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. Take a moment and just stop there. This is a little added bonus. This isn't a part of the main service, but it's a little bit added bonus here. 
Samuel's sons were just like Eli's sons. It's kind of interesting. I see that, that there was this pattern that Eli, Eli was kind of uh, the adoptive father of the sword of Samuel because he raised Samuel up and led Samuel. And you see that Samuel had the same issue that Eli had. It's very important to remember this as leaders, whether you're a leader in your home, whether you're a leader here in the church, what you do and how you do things is important because people are watching. And as people watch you, they're going to learn either learn more about how to be in God and God's ways or how to be in the world and the world's ways. We need to be careful about that as leaders. Just a little extra added to this morning to you, to this message. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. Extra little added here this morning. Not a part of the main message, but... A little bit of a rabbit trail again this morning. I have squirrel moments, so just bear with me. This is a squirrel squirrel moment. He was disappointed. When he was disappointed, what did he do? He didn't go and yell at the person that he was disappointed at. He didn't go and lecture the person he was disappointed at. He didn't give them a tongue lashing. He went to the Lord in prayer. I implore you. We all deal with conflict every day, whether it's conflict in the home, conflict in the workplace, conflict out in the world around us, our neighbors and that fence that they put up on your property, though they say it wasn't on your property and you want to tear that wall down, you know. Before you do something in haste, James says this, listen, listen then speak. But here, added on to this is Samuel. Go to the Lord in prayer first. See how the Lord would want you to handle this, how to deal with this. Get you out of a lot of trouble sometimes, because I know how it can be to get, get yourself in trouble, to say something off the cuff and it's not good. Just another added little bonus today. Aren't you glad you came? (laughs) <laughs> all right now i gotta find my place <laughs> listen <clears throat> and the lord told him listen to all that the people are saying to you it is not you they have rejected but they have rejected me as their king as they have done from the day i brought them up out of egypt until this day forsaking me and serving other gods So they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses. They will run in front of his chariots. Some of them will, uh, will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of 50. Others to plow his ground and reap his harvest. And still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will make your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants he will take a tenth of your grain of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use he will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves 
When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all the people had said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the Israelites, everyone go back to your own town. Israel wanted a king. They wanted a figurehead to wear a crown. Someone to wear a crown, to be a representative for them, to lead them, to guide them. They wanted a king. Before this, they were governed by elders. They were governed by maybe one leader who was called up to help them lead through an occupation, which, by the way, was their own fault. They didn't really need a judge. They only needed a judge because they disobeyed God. And when they disobeyed God, God oppressed them. And when they were oppressed, they cried out to God. And God brought a judge to lead them for a time. But before this, they were governed by the elders. They were governed by themselves. Each person and family had liberties. They had their own property. They were blessed. They had, uh, you know, food. They had their rights to go here, go there. They had all these liberties. But Israel wanted a king because they wanted to be like other nations. You've never done something because you wanted to be like someone else, right? You never bought some type of clothing because you wanted to be like someone else. You've never, you know changed your fashion style or your look because you wanted to be like somebody else. It's that idea that we want to fit in, that we want to be a part of this group, and sometimes we may even be willing to give up some of our liberties, some of our own creativeness, our own being, in order to try to fit in and be like someone else. God made you unique. Why do you want to be somebody else? It's taken me a long time to realize that God made me weird. And, you know, I'm okay being weird. But Israel wanted to be like other nations. And this is not what God designed them to be. It says, you are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy. I have set you apart from the nations to be my own. They were unique. They were God's nation. They were God's people in the Old Testament. God set them apart and to be holy. And yet, They wanted to be like the other nations. And so they adopted idol worship, which was useless. The idols that they prayed to, the idols that they had were useless. The idols could do nothing. It was just a statue. It was just a pole. It was just something. But for whatever reason, because they wanted to see something visual, because they wanted to be like other nations and see the other nations around them, and they wanted to have the same thing, they idol worship from the very start when they were delivered from Egypt. And now they wanted a political system just like the other nations. They wanted a king to lead lead them for military protection. It says, but the people refused to listen. Samuel, uh, listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all other nations with a king to lead us and go out before us and fight our battles. But here's the thing. They had the greatest general of all time with the greatest army that is beyond any army this world could ever have. The Lord of hosts. The Lord of the... Uh, of the angels and believe me the angels aren't those little cute little figurines that we see with the nice little halo and the little wings and the pretty little 
I mean, any time anybody saw angels in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, they were afraid. They were scared. So here, the God who led them out of the hands of Pharaoh and Egypt, the God who led them out of the oppression into the land of, uh, uh, of Canaan and, and took down the walls of Jericho. Joshua did nothing but walk around a wall for seven days with the army. There was nothing they could do to get through that wall, but God got them in. Every time that they were oppressed and a judge came up, it wasn't the judge that led them. It was God that delivered them. And yet they still forgot that they had a God and all the things that God did for them. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. They had forgotten everything that God had done for them. You know what? God foresaw it, though. It didn't surprise God. It's not what God wanted for them. It's not what God wanted for the Israelites. He wanted to be their king, but he foresaw it. In Deuteronomy 17, 14, and 15, it says, When you enter the land your God, uh, your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us uh, like all the other nations around us. Be sure to appoint you a king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your fellow Israelites. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not an Israelite. So God even knew it was going to happen. You don't shock God by your decisions. God knows what we're going to do in his sovereignty. However, God wants us to choose him. Who or what is the king of our lives this morning? What rules our lives, our thoughts, our actions? Do you ever think about that? What rules our lives, our thoughts, our actions? And if if it isn't God... And it's overly something else. That may be the king of your life. Do we trust God with the things of our lives or not? Do we take it in our own hands to do it in our own selves? Do we, we rely on others and rely on other things rather than God ourselves to allow to lead us and help us? And in whom or what do we seek deliverance? Do we seek deliverance from God? Or do we try the things of the world or things of the world or people to help us or try to deliver us from things in our lives? Or ourselves, do we put it all on ourselves until the point we break and we can't take any more? Things to think about this morning as we proceed on in this message. I really want you to think about that. I really want you to take a moment and really think, who is really the king of your life this morning? God gives them what they ask for. God is never going to not let you make a decision. He's not going to stop you. He's going to warn you. He's going to try to reach out to you, but in the end, he's going to let you have that ability to make that decision. It's like a kid, you know, when they get old enough and they leave the house, or even when they're growing old and you are growing older in your house and you want them to make the right decisions, but they don't always make the right decision. We can't, we can give them guidance, we can give them punishment. We can give them, you know, attaboys when they do, the, do it right. But in the end, 
as they grow older, they have to make their own decisions. But he gives them what they ask for with a warning and the consequences of their decision. Here's the warning. This is what the king who will reign over you will claim, uh, claim as his rights. Gives them a warning that the king is going to claim a lot of things from them. He's going to reign over them. It isn't going to be what you think it is. You think you're going to get this nice king who's going to wear this nice little crown, and you can be like the other nations with him running around as, as your leader. But in the end, he's going to reign over you. He's going to lord over you. When the day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. You're going to have to face the consequences of having a king. You're going to realize that that weight of that king's crown isn't going to be just on his head, but it's going to be on the head of each and every one of you as you deal with with making a king over God being your king. So here's the consequences. Things will be taken from them. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some will, uh, will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties. They're going to serve in war, in battle. And in fact, you're probably going to have some of you guys... And gals, your sons are going to die in battle. You're going to lose your sons because they are going to be in his command, the king's command, rather than with you. And others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. So basically, the sons that would have been there to help you with your own farms, your own house, your own place, and setting up lives for themselves and continuing on your lineage and your heritage, they're going to be taken away from you. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. Daughters who would most likely bring families and bring grandsons and granddaughters and once again continuing the family line. No longer will they be doing that, but in fact they'll be in the service of the king. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. He's going to tax you. How many people love tax? How many people get around April 15th and be like, ooh, tax forms, let's get them ready. I think that's probably the biggest shock when you, become, when you first start working as a kid. And you start thinking, who is this, uh, who is this taking this butt out here? What is state take, take, taking that? Why is the federal taking out this? What is this social security thing being taken out? Holy moly. <laughs> the realization of taxation. That rhymes. I'm sorry. I had to say it because I just, in my head, I, if I didn't get it out, it would have been in my head all day. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys, he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks. All this stuff to have a king so that they can be cool like all the other nations. I know, I'm just trying to get this on more and more throughout the, throughout the sermon. But to be cool, to be like the other nations, all the things he's going to take away from them. And listen to what he says at the end, and you yourselves will become his slaves. You're basically putting yourself in slavery. God warned them and told them of the consequences of their decision. And yet they still wanted a king. 
See, God warns us, and there are consequences to our unwillingness to listen to God. We talked a few weeks ago when we were talking about um, Samuel and his call, the different ways that God talks to us. So this isn't new. This is something we talked about a few weeks ago, but I'm going to share it again, especially when it comes to talking about the things that God is warning us about. A few weeks ago, we were talking about how God's calling us. Today, we're talking about the fact of how God warns us and the consequences of our unwillingness to listen. He speaks through his word. That's why he gave us this this book. It wasn't for a nice bedtime story to read. But in fact, he gave us this and so that we know his ways, that we know the truth, so that we might live our lives without having to deal with the consequences of sin if we apply this in our lives. He gave us the word and so that we might be instructed on how we can live our lives. Jesus came and he was truly human. And in his human life, he gave us an example to live by. As we're reading the word and we're reading about Jesus' life, we realize what we should strive for. Not that we could ever be perfect like God because we are imperfect, because we have the effects of sin in our lives and we will struggle with sin until we are glorified when we cross over with him in eternity. But he has given us the mark to strive by, by listening and looking at Jesus' example of life and trying to live that out in our own lives. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there. It's not the little devil and a little angel there, you know, on your shoulder. We do know that Satan does try to talk to us too. He tries to get us and tempt us and he tries to put doubts in our minds. But we have a voice that is louder and we have a voice that has authority over that other voice in our lives and that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there. But we have to learn to listen. When the Holy Spirit tells us to do something, we do it. Just like when my wife tells us us in our house, us, myself and the kids to do something, we do it, you know, she's the, the authority voice in the house, you know, it's the same way in our lives, the Holy Spirit, and he gives us the church, godly counsel between leaders in the church, elders in the church, people that we can go to and talk to, who can give us godly wisdom and counsel. And folks, there is consequences to our actions when we disobey the willful, we willfully disobey the God, uh, God's will. Not just consequences for, see, I've got a consequence here if I go over this. I stopped it at, you got me, Jerry, you got me, I'm listening. I have the voice of Jerry saying, stop right here. I'm at the, I'm at the, I'm at the mark. But we have consequences that don't just affect us, but affect other people as well. Do you realize when we sin, it's not just ourselves that is often hurt by that, but other people. Consequences that can be lifelong consequences that carry with us even though God has taken that away from us and the guilt away from us and has forgiven us. And when we come to the Lord and we receive forgiveness from God, he may take that guilt and stuff away, but there may be consequences that we still have to deal with in this world because of the actions that we did. I see the consequences every day when people come in and want to do counseling and talk about things that are going on, how one little choice causes a ripple of destruction throughout families, workplaces, lives. 
See, God wants to be our, the king of our lives because God knows what's best for us. God wants to be the king of our lives, not to lord over us as a earthly king would or a sin in our lives would or something that we set up as king, whether it be ourselves or someone else or our job or whatever it is that we set up as the king of our lives. He doesn't want to lord over like those things would lord over us. Jesus didn't come in order to put a crown like this on his head. He came to do something different. I'm walking out of the circle. I'm sorry. I'll be back in the circle in a minute. I just have to grab something. I'm just joking too, Jerry. I'm just joking. I don't want anybody thinking, oh my word, he's so mean to the Jerry back there in the... uh, Sound booth. He came to wear a different crown. He came to be a king by sacrificing his life on the cross for us that we might find freedom from the things that entrap us, the things that imprison us, the things that enslave us. He took a crown of thorns on his head. That is the kind of king that God is. A God who cares for you, a God that wants to see you delivered, a God that wants to stand for you, a God that wants to be there for you, a God that wants to help you, a God that wants to deliver you, a God that wants to transform you, a God that wants to change you. Not after his own interest, but after you because he loves you this much. This scripture isn't going to be on the screen because I was talking to someone today, this morning. They may be watching right now. Um, But we were talking about some of the issues and struggles that we're going through in our lives. And I shared this message, this uh, this, this verse because it came to me. And I knew it was from God. But it says, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus came to be a king to show us the way that we might be able to live a life that is good. Not without struggles, not without strife, but a good life to deliver us from those things in our lives that cause us pain and sorrow, the consequences. He came to give us the truth. The truth that goes beyond any of this worldly truth that we see. Truth is not relative. There is one truth and that is in God. And we can discuss it all you want. But at the end of the day, that is what I truly believe. Because I believe God came with a truth that can transform and change our lives. If we put him as the king, he will show us the true truth. And he is the life. Those kings and those things that we put up in kings take from our life all day long. They sap us. They sap our energy. They sap our emotions. They sap our resources. But God came to be a king that gives us life. And he did this because he cares about us. And he loves us and he knows the future. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plan, plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Our plans fall short. Proverbs 19, 21 says, many are the plans of a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. So why do we keep putting other things in our lives and other things as kings when we know truly that the Lord will prevail in the end? He knows our futures. He cares for us. And he loves us.
Who's the king of your life? What rules your life? And what's the benefit of what that king gives you in your life? There's only one who can give you life, who can give you restoration, who can give you good things, who doesn't make you a slave, but makes you a child of his. And that's God this morning. Won't you put God as your king this morning? Heavenly Father, most gracious God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your love, your mercy. Lord, I thank you that you came to die for us. Lord, I pray right now as we leave this place today, you will go before us, watch over us, protect us. Lord, may we see you and see your ways through the things that we deal with this week and bring us back next week so we can praise you for all that you have done. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. May the peace and grace of God go with you this week.